Hello, welcome back to part two, if you're still listening. Um, so now I'm going to talk about major threats to biodiversity, which is a big aspect of conservation biology. So the seven greatest threats, which are kind of rearranged and restructured a lot of the time, but these are the seven concepts that you have to remember, are habitat destruction, habitat fragmentation, environmental degradation and pollution, global climate change, overexploitation, invasive species, and disease. So I'm going to go into each of these um, specifically. So the first one, habitat destruction, um, basically it's the removal of habitat. Um, and so we often picture these kind of at big scales as the clear cutting of the Amazon rainforest or building a city in an area that used to be nature. Um, but it can happen at super small scales as well. Maybe just putting in a parking lot covers up some important wetland habitat or um, grassland or forest or something like that. So we can think about this at both small and large scales um, in terms of habitat destruction. So the hard thing about habitat destruction is that where we see an organism might not be where it always occurs. So we have a lot of migratory species around the globe that need habitat in all different locations. So anadromous fish like salmon um, spend most of their adult lives in the ocean feeding but they need to come into freshwater to spawn. So they come up rivers and streams to lay their eggs and their eggs hatch there. Um, this means that both that freshwater area and that uh, marine area need to be preserved. And also there needs to be a connection between them. So building dams along a lot of these rivers can stop the fish from being able to move into their good spawning habitat and that can hurt the population. Um, same with birds who, you know, a dam wouldn't stop them, but migratory birds like this, this yellow warbler, um, they spend their summers up here um, breeding in North America, but they go down to South America and Central America for wintering. And so not only do they need breeding habitat, they need pristine uh, wintering habitat. And then along the way, they need areas during migration that we call stopover habitat, which is little patches or places where they can stop eat, um, rest, and refuel to continue their journey. So this little guy, the yellow warbler, you know, is like a 10 or 11 gram bird. Um, and it's really important that they have those places to stop and rest and eat on their big migration north. So the other side of habitat destruction wholesale is just habitat fragmentation. So this is the idea that you can take a big parcel of uninterrupted habitat and if you start putting roads or railroads or trails or housing developments in it, we basically fragment that area um, and make a whole bunch of different subplots. So what's the big deal with this? Well, it causes kind of a cascade of problems. So first of all, some animals don't wanna move outside of kind of their habitat and so they're stuck and they're limited in their dispersal and ability to colonize new areas. This also causes restricted access to food and mate um, and creates a whole bunch of smaller populations that aren't intermixing their genetics. Um, it also escalates some of the interspecies interactions like invasive species where they now have kind of a highway conduit to get into some of these more pristine areas. And then it causes a whole host of edge effects. So what's an edge effect? This is something that if you had, if we're thinking about a forest and it's uninterrupted big forest, along the edges of it, there's basically things that happen like wind disturbance, uh, tree mortality, uh, reduced canopy height, where basically um, because it's not protecting itself at the edge, it can have some disturbance. So if you start putting a whole bunch of these edges throughout the habitat, it increases the um, kind of danger to the forest as a whole. And so this graph is showing kind of both a list of all the different things that are edge effects, so what influences forests, all the way from uh, lower soil moisture content up to tree mortality, and then how far this edge effect uh, penetrates into the forest. So um, increased wind disturbance can still happen 400 meters away from the edge. So you could see if you were cutting up your forest in a whole bunch of different ways, maybe the whole forest is now at uh, risk for increased wind damage. And we can see that in real time. Um, these are some pictures that I took last year in the alumni woods. So right off the back of the alumni dorms um, or apartments, there's a really nice wooded walking trail. If you haven't been on there, next time we get back to campus, you should definitely check it out. Um, and there's some beautiful old growth trees back there, um, but we've seen a whole bunch of them come down. And the ones that have come down kind of seem to be closer to the edge. 
they experienced high winds during a couple storms along with some ice damage and then these big trees ended up coming down. So you can kind of see this edge effect in real time. Um, our next major cause of um, problems to species is overexploitation. So first one is the global wildlife trade. So this is um, trading for both pets, so like taking an endangered species out of the wild and making it a pet, and also for kind of consumptive value. So this is a new story from just a couple years ago um, where they found 10,000 of these really endangered tortoises um, in Madagascar that were getting ready to be shipped. So we kind of think of that in terms of like wildlife trade, but also just in general, overfishing and overhunting of certain areas can lead to declines in population. So anytime um, basically like you have free reign over um, a population, you can see potentially that that population could decline, which is why we have a bunch of rules and laws and international treaties that kind of guide um, how many of these organisms we're allowed to take so that the population can keep sustaining itself. So it's not the idea that we can't hunt or fish at all, we should you know, hunt and fish, but doing it in a responsible way that allows the population to recover so that future generations can still be able to hunt and fish. Um, also, um, introduced species or invasive species are a big issue um, in conservation right now. Um, and this is the issue of bringing a species that didn't um, evolve in an area and then moving it to a new area. Some of them are done intentionally and, uh, and some of them are done accidentally. Um, a lot of times we'll bring a species over thinking, oh, I'd love to have this species here, um, and then realize that they can take over. So why would um, species introduction be a problem? So hopefully this whole semester you've been talking a lot about evolution and natural selection. So this kind of plays into that. So normally um, when a group of organisms or community has been able to undergo natural selection together, it makes it so that one can't overexploit and uh, push the others to extinction. Um, just because that maybe wouldn't be beneficial for them in the end, because uh, if a predator drives its prey to extinction, then um, it will also die. So in normal systems that have been allowed to undergo natural selection together, we kind of see um, not any one species um, driving the rest of the population. But when a species gets brought in from another area that hasn't been going, undergoing the same natural selection with the other members of the community, we can see this particular um, organism kind of take over. And so that's why now a lot of research is being done on what are the effects of these invasive species and how can we stop them. So if you go boating in the area, a lot of times you see uh, signs asking you to make sure your boat's clean if so that you don't move um, invasive plants or organisms between different lakes or anything like that. So on campus, um, there's a ton of invasive plants where anytime you see something overrun with one specific plant, um, you can kind of get an idea that that might be an invasive species. So ones to highlight are um, calorie pear, Japanese knotweed, and porcelain berry. Um, in all of these cases, I know it's really hard to know what you're looking at, and so I recommend this app, iNaturalist. It's really fun, especially for those who are homebound or only looking around your yard. I've been using it to identify things in my yard. Um, you basically go on and take a picture of whatever you're looking at, and then you can actually get basically AI recommendations of what they think it is, and then the whole community will help offer, uh, actual people will tell you what the different thing is. So it's a really helpful thing if you want to learn more plants in your area. Um, so uh, now I want to show you this video that was done by Sean Sandell, who graduated last year. Um, he took conservation biology with me and made this really awesome video about um, invasive species management. So. Um, I'm going to just get out of here for a second so I can show you it. Invasive Species Management Invasive species have been a big problem when it comes to the biodiversity of the places they invade. There are many ways for invasive species to arrive to countries they are not native to. The most common way is by human transport. 
These non-native species are transported by plane and boat, both accidentally and intentionally. When a non-native invasive species becomes successful and has a self-sustaining population, it becomes a pest. Being a pest is defined as having a negative economic impact. One invasive species that has become a pest in the United States is multiflora rose. The range of multiflora rose can be found from New York to California. Multiflora rose was introduced to the U.S. from Japan in 1866 for ornamental cultivation of the plant. The U.S. Forest Service has classified multiflora rose as one of the top forest invasive plant species in the northeastern area. Multiflora rose has negative impacts on native plant species by growing very well and taking up space so native plants cannot grow. Now, before you decide to go full Rambo and start murdering multiflora rose or other invasive plant species, you need to know how to properly remove invasive plant species. Invasive species management is a complex issue. Coordinated management is needed to deal with invasive species between governmental agencies and the community. Using adaptive and collabor collaborative approaches can assist in eradicating, controlling, or mitigating invasive species. There are two types of management strategies. Adaptive management, which is learning by doing, and co-management, which is social and institutional learning. By linking these two together, you get adaptive co-management. This linking function creates connections between public, private, and nonprofit sectors and between levels of government. There is a gap between research of invasive species and management. Connecting scientists to landowners, managers, and policymakers can help them with dealing with invasive plants. If you want to be a part of invasive species management where you live, ask your local government if there are any programs that you can be a part of to remove invasive species and help the native species return. Isn't that great? I love, I love that. Um, no. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, okay, so going back to invasive species, right? Um, so invasive plants can have kind of cascade effects. This is something that happened to me last year on campus. So I was driving um, into work and saw this red-tailed hawk who had gotten stuck in one of the invasive thickets of um, porcelainberry and multiflora rose that we have on campus. So um, he had basically got a uh, piece of the vine stuck around his wing and he couldn't get out of it. Um, so I ended up being able to get a towel and kind of helping him out of that by cutting him out of it with the help of um, some of UPD. And that kind of got me thinking like we don't even think about this but if no one had been around to help him I don't know how he would have gotten out of that predicament. Um, partially because red-tailed hawks you know they hunt by kind of swooping in he's probably going after a squirrel or a rabbit or a mouse or something in that thicket. Um, but normally our native, native um, shrubs are not quite as weedy and viney as what he kind of got into. Um, another case study, this is from um, the Caribbean more so, is the invasive lionfish. So this is a fish that's beautiful, um, but has escaped um, in parts of Florida and the Caribbean into these beautiful coral reefs. It has no natural predators in that area because it has, its spines are highly toxic. And so it basically can grow um, unencumbered um, and take out a lot of the natural ecosystem there. So I talked about, you know, both uh, uh, plant and animal uh, types. Um, one of the biggest uh, things which might get me in trouble with some people are domestic cats, which don't get me wrong, I love cats, but um, we have found over the years that um, cats that are allowed to go outside are one of the biggest pillars of both birds and small mammals. For the same reason that we've been talking about, these guys are not native to North America. Our um, bird and animal populations are not used to having a killer such as cats um, in the area. 
And so the big answer is mostly just to keep them inside. There has been some limited research that putting a bell or some sort of bright colored um, uh, collar on them can help because it gives the animals some sort of warning that the cat is coming. But in general, keep your cat inside um, to help the bird population. Um, another set of um, threats to biodiversity is caused by environmental degradation and pollution. So this is actually the field that I work in and got my PhD in, which is called ecotoxicology, um, the effect of man-made contaminants on the environment. And this woman, Rachel Carson, is my personal hero in the whole environmental movement. Um, in the 60s, she wrote a book called Silent Spring, um, which basically warned of the dangers of contaminants in the environment which back in the day, people weren't really thinking about the fact that what we could be doing in terms of these new contaminants um, could be hurting them. So she talked a lot about DDT, which was a pesticide that was being sprayed at the time because it killed mosquitoes and all sorts of bugs. And so people thought it was um, saving the world because it was killing mosquitoes that, hurt, that carried malaria. It was um, stopping agricultural pests. And what she showed is that it was actually having a big impact on a whole bunch of different um, wildlife populations. And her title, Silent Spring, is basically to say like, hey, um, wouldn't it be sad if in the spring you didn't hear birds and frogs and all those things that you're used to hearing because um, we killed them all. So um, there's some great documentaries about her if you're interested in reading more and watching more. So kind of closer to home, I want to go over this quick case study of PCBs. So PCBs are a polychlorinated bifenyl. Um, it describes a whole large group of contaminants. So um, there's a whole bunch of different types of PCBs based on their um, chemical component. They're not easily, uh, they don't easily break down, which makes them super useful for industry because they're not just gonna de degrade and fall apart. But it, we also found out that they are very harmful to the environment. So new production was banned in the 1970s but um, we can still use products where PCBs are contained. Um, they're so slow to break down in the environment that they're still an issue today. Um, they were used in so many things at the time because they were seen as kind of this perfect cure-all because they were really stable and had really low flammability. So they were used as coolants, insulating fluids, transformers, almost all types of electricity had PCBs in them. So they were really, really common. Um, which is why they're such an issue now, because they were, they're, they've gotten into the environment and they take a really long time to break down. So the case study that I'm going to talk about is the Hudson River, a little bit north of where we are in Westchester County. Um, but basically over the years, General Electric dumped what we think is 1.3 million pounds of PCBs into the Hudson um, between 1947 and 1977. Most of that amount was from capacitor manufacturing plants in the Hudson Falls and Fort Edward area, so kind of north. Um, but General Motors also contaminated near, near Terrytown. So there's a lot of different areas of the Hudson that are closed to fishing um, because of this PCB issue. And so the General Electric issue, they um, obviously have done a lot of cleanup, um, including dredging the riverbed and removing contaminated sediments. Um, and GE, uh, a few years ago, lobbied hard to say that their cleanup is done. They wanted what was called a certificate of completion, which says we've done everything we can do and it's cleaned up. But a lot of people, including um, biologists in the area, say this job is not done. There are still PCBs in the river and um, we, have an, we have an issue with this. You, you don't get your certificate of completion. So um, last April, um, the EPA did um, issue the certificate of completion um, on the Hudson River to GE, but down here it also says separately, its five-year review was, review was also released, which says the EPA is not sure whether parts of the 40 miles of upper Hudson River are clean enough to protect human health in the environment, and more fish data will be collected. So this was an issue that they said it was cleaned up, but also at the same time, we're not sure it actually was cleaned up. And so late August last year, um, New York sued the US EPA, um, accusing the agency of prematurely allowing GE to stop clearing the Hudson River PCB contamination before the cleanup was finished. Um, uh, and so from this lawsuit, the New York officials are seeking to void that certificate of completion, um, which means that GE needs to keep doing work to clean up the river. 
And try as I might, I cannot find an, an update on this. I think what probably happened um, is that it was working its way through the legal system when um, this pandemic started and now nothing's moving forward anymore. So I would say keep an eye out for this. I don't think it's over, but I think definitely everything's delayed right now. Um, but hopefully we'll see a news story in the future about um, what's happening in terms of GE's cleanup of the Hudson River. So moving on to another um, risk to biodiversity is disease. So I want to highlight white nose syndrome in bats, which is kind of shown on this bat on the right here. It's a fungus that um, infects the bats and they see it as white nose. It makes their nose white, but it's fungus. Um, the issue that comes with it is that they think it causes the bats to wake up too much during the winter when they're trying to hibernate. And that causes them to lose all of their fat reserves and end up starving to death over the winter when they normally shouldn't. Um, so this disease is very dangerous for um, bats. We, it actually got introduced from probably a European cave to um, caves in uh, the New York area, basically by a traveler probably bringing it in on their shoe and then exploring a new cave. Um, so this is both a disease that's a big issue because it's swept through um, North America, but it's also an invasive species. So our bats in North America just had never experienced this fungus before, but it's common in Europe and other areas, and the bats there don't die from it in the same way. So this is an issue that um, if our bats had been exposed to this through their evolutionary history, we would have potentially had, they would have developed the ability through adaptation to survive, but we brought it in with no ability for natural selection to occur. So the hope is actually that we are kind of seeing towards the end of this and some bats are able to survive and those are the ones that are going to pass on their genes to future generations and potentially have um, some sort of immunity to this. And then the big one, so global climate change. It's impossible to talk about threats to biodiversity without talking about climate change. So I hope everybody kind of knows the basics of climate change. Um, it is not, the reason it has shifted away from calling it global warming is that it's not just that we're going to see a warming climate, we're going to see changes in all these different things. So decrease in glaciers, increased temperature, increased humidity, increased sea surface temperature, decreased sea ice, increased sea level. And then in a lot of areas we might see increased um, natural disturbances, wildfires, that type of stuff, increased drought. So that's why this kind of movement has become called climate change and we don't refer to it as global warming anymore. It's going to impact a whole bunch of different things. This isn't just being a little warmer. So let me show you another video that I think is really good. atmosphere is a mixture of gases. Some are known as greenhouse gases. That's because they trap heat from the sun and warm the earth. That's good because without greenhouse gases, our planet would freeze and life as most of us know it would be impossible. These greenhouse gases, mainly water vapor and carbon dioxide, naturally cycle between the land and atmosphere and ocean. And over the ages, these greenhouse gases have reached a delicate balance that results in temperatures that we like, a lot. It's been that way for thousands of years, until the last 150 years. That's when people began burning fossil fuels. Those fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, contain carbon that's been locked away from the natural cycle for eons. But when we burn them, that carbon joins with oxygen to make carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere. It throws the natural balance out of whack. The more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the more heat that is trapped and the warmer it gets. And the warmer it gets, the more the climate changes and the higher the ocean will rise. The more we learn about carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, the better we can deal with the changes caused by global warming. Because good planets are hard to find. Okay, so hopefully that's a review for you guys about um, climate change. Um, 
Um, so the important thing, right, is that climate change is caused by increased carbon dioxide um, in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide comes from burning of fossil fuels, so uh, burning oil, making electricity, all those things, um, a lot of them come from the burning of fossil fuels. So in terms of global climate change, um, who is at risk? Again, it seems like the poster children for this are often those charismatic megafauna, um, but almost all species are at risk. So we kind of picture something like a polar bear when we think about climate change, but often even desert species are at risk because we're not talking just about melting sea ice, we're talking about increased droughts and increased um, fire and all of those things, so they can also be at risk. Um, this is another video uh, kind of highlighting maybe one that you didn't think of as potentially at risk to climate change. Um, this is in the ocean. Um, <laughs> there is a disclaimer on this. There's like a point where a lot of strobe lighting comes. And so like, please heed the seizure warning that um, they put on this. This was my student last year, Batya Nightingale. Um, and the video is amazing. I've never seen such a beautiful video put together, but there is one point with a lot of um, strobe lighting. So look away for that. If I were a bivalve, a cone of Balfica in the Baltic Sea, I would live beneath the waves, purifying the ocean as I filter feed. I serve a vital role in the aquatic ballet of life. Each year, I wait until the water has warmed to the perfect temperature to release my sperm or eggs. My gametes fly through the sea, seeking their counterparts to form beautiful baby bivalves. Every year, a perfectly synchronous phytoplankton bloom feeds my babies so that they can grow big and strong. Our ecosystem is dancing to the beat of the seasons. My babies eat and eat and grow thick shells to protect themselves from becoming shrimp snack. Not today, Krangon, Krangon! But our climate is changing. Anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions are at an all-time high. Greenhouse gases trapped in the atmosphere raise temperatures around the globe. Oceans are warming. The potential for a catastrophic ecosystem cascade grows. As the water warms, I fall out of sync with the ballet of life beneath the waves. The temperature is telling me it's time to spawn again, but something doesn't feel quite right. Where's the phytoplankton bloom? They're late, or maybe I was early? The aquatic symphony is out of sync. Ah, there they are. Quick, my babies. Eat, eat. Grow big and strong. Oh no, my babies have not had enough to eat. They're weak. What's happening? Where did the rhythm of the seasons go? My babies are shrimp snack. We will clean our water now. This is just one story among millions. Species interactions and ecosystem dances are threatened by rising temperatures across the globe. If nothing is done, we will all be shrimp snacks. All right, I hope you enjoyed that one. Um, so besides being, you know, beautiful, uh, 
the idea behind that is that you know we're not just talking polar bears right we're talking now about um little bivalves in the ocean um but uh basically when their food comes in uh out of sync with when they need it this can cause issues so those are kind of the host of issues that we see with climate change um and we often talk about that climate change, there will be some winners and there will be some losers. So there is a possibility that some species might be able to adapt. So some species can move their range northward to follow the climate, um, but they need to be mobile and have somewhere to go. Um, and we might, the changing climate might be able to select for individuals that persist. So in big populations that have fast generation times, it's easier to see these adaptations occurring. So if you are something like a plant species, there are some uh, models that show that um, basically we're going to see a northward migration of a lot of the plant species that we know. This is um, what the different forests will look like. So if we happen to be, we're a maple beech birch uh, climax community here now, we're gonna become more like an oak hickory, oak pine community in the future because basically those southern um, forest communities are gonna move north. Um, other species are basically going to be the losers and because they can't adapt fast enough. Um, so either their desired climate doesn't exist. Um, so if the, uh, all the sea ice uh, melts, the polar bears don't have anywhere to go. And then in general, populations that have slow generation times, really small populations without a lot of genetic variation, uh, natural selection can't work on these guys. So this means it's all happening too fast and they don't have the ability to adapt. So that's kind of why we worry about things like polar bears. So why are small populations such a big problem? Um, the issue really is the loss of genetic diversity. So when a population kind of declines um, to a really small size, it goes through a genetic bottleneck. Um, and what this means is that it loses some individual diversity in the population. Um, the loss of genetic diversity would be an issue basically because of what we were just talking about. Um, the ability of a population to adapt means that some of the individuals need to have certain traits that allow them to adapt to this new climate. And if the population has gone through a severe genetic bottleneck, they maybe don't have those type of um, traits that allow them to persist. Cheaters are one of these examples that's often used as a population bottleneck where there's very little genetic diversity in cheetah populations now, which makes them really hard to adapt to any future scenarios. Okay, so that's the end of part two. Um, I'm gonna try to talk about some more hopeful things or controversial things in the next